They lit the torch that we now carry. The pioneers, the game changers, the giants. Men and women like Marie Skwodowska Curie, Louis Pasteur, and Alexander Fleming, whose groundbreaking work changed the world. Millions of lives were saved, and many other medical innovations since then have transformed the way we live. But diseases keep changing, and infections we've treated for decades can once again kill. It's a critical time for medicine, and the Innovative Medicines Initiative is an unprecedented partnership between the public and private sectors. This collaboration will help speed up the medicine development process and turn knowledge into treatment more quickly. Moreover, it can unlock preventative solutions and drive better diagnosis. The road is long, but we won't stop trying because the light of medical progress still burns bright. Everybody, my name is Maxine Mawinney, and I'm going to be your moderator for this really packed schedule. As if you've been looking at your agenda this afternoon, we're celebrating 10 years of the Innovative Medicines Initiative and what a 10 years it has been. The event today is just to celebrate and to show in just four hours what 10 years of achievements can bring, the value for patients, doctors, healthcare systems, and also, of course, for research. Now, IMI is the first, the biggest, and still unique PPP in health research. So what has it achieved? Well, you can see here. I'm not going to read it all out to you. You can read it. But also, 10 years, 100 projects addressing all the major health challenges. We've had changes in society, and patients are at the heart of the program. Diabetes, respiratory, cancer, Alzheimer's, resistant infections, but also prevention, medicine safety, health outcomes. I want to welcome the scientists, decision makers in the commission, and of course in the industry, the policy makers, the patients, health advocates on stage and also in the audience today, the commissioner, DG and DGG, chief executives from FPA. I'm not going to go through the program. You can read it yourself because we have a really packed afternoon for you. So let's start talking about Europe's partnership for health. And welcome to the stage, Jean-Éric Pacque, who's the director general, DG Research and Innovation for the EC, and also Jean-Christophe Tellier, the Chief Executive Officer of UCB. Thank you very much uh, for this introduction. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure for me to be opening this event celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Innovative Medicines Initiative. And frankly, I don't think you could have a much better introduction, not by me, obviously, but by the short movie uh, we, sh we saw just a moment ago, which I think captures particularly well why IMI is needed and why IMI is making a difference. And jean Christophe, I'm very happy to open the event uh, with you this afternoon. So we have a packed agenda, which is in subtext means be short, please, in your opening words, and I will try to, try to do that. I would like to come back, nevertheless, uh, for a few minutes on, on why um, IMI, why industry, <coughs> public authorities, and the Commission decided uh, to uh, create the Innovative <coughs> Medicines Initiative back in uh, 2008. At the time, uh, one of the drivers, key objectives, was to increase investment in research and with that uh, strengthen the competitiveness, competitive basis of the pharmaceutical sector in Europe. At the time, the migration of investments in pharmaceutical research to other regions of the world was a major concern for Euro Europe's industry, 
but also for its public partners and an important driver on our side to establish uh, IMI. The initiative, of course, had as another objective to foster more collaboration between all stakeholders in the field, including industry, public authorities, patients' organizations, academia, and clinical centers. And I expect that most of our discussions now in the afternoon will exemplify how well IMI delivered on these objectives. In fact, IMI was, uh, I, I understand, one of the very first partnerships to be put in place uh, with an extremely wide uh, basis in terms of stakeholders and partners, which explains much of the success of the last 10 years. IMI was also created to overcome research bottlenecks with the long-term aim to speed up the development of more effective and safe medicines for patients. In particular, to reduce the risk of failure of novel therapies in late stages of development when there has already been significant investment. I mean, I'm told, uh, and I should forget, that the timelines for drug developments are long. Innovations may take up to 15, 20 years from discovery to reach healthcare application. To be compared with other sectors, such as ICT, where this uh, innovation lead time is counted in, in some, not months, but in a, in a very limited number of years. It's therefore great, and the exhibition outside um, uh, is a testimony to it, it's therefore great to see that IMI-funded projects now start to effectively have an impact on drug development. Numerous results and tools have been developed, as you will discover through the presentations today. IMI 2 uh, was established in 2014 with an expanded scope uh, covering now research across the full innovation cycle and engaging an even broader range of partners, including from additional industrial sectors and more public authorities. And this wider participation further helps the development of novel approaches and technologies for the prevention, diagnosis and treatment of diseases with very high impact on public health. Now, there has been uh, an evaluation also on the impact of IMI2, uh, which has confirmed the new opportunities created, including for non-pharmaceutical companies to participate. So 10 years since uh, IMI was created, and I think many of you were there already uh, 10 years ago, IMI is a strong and well-recognized brand, in particular in an international context. And IMI, in fact, remains absolutely unique worldwide. No other program in the health sector has enabled such a scale of collaboration between companies and between sectors and public organizations, including now more and more patients and regulatory organizations and public authorities. In reality, IMI, um, at least from the, these, the, the short notes which I use now for my uh, opening address, looks like the ideal partnership. A real, commit real commitment uh, from industry, uh, which is uh, bringing uh, a lot uh, into the initiative from its own resources, a very broad basis of engagement with patients and a large set of stakeholders, and many public authorities in Europe engaging alongside industry, together with a solid and necessary dialogue with regulators. And that, I think, equips IMI uh, with a very, very solid starting point in the process which now opens around Horizon Europe, where the Commission, uh, with the European Parliament and Member States, will revisit, review uh, the very large number of partnerships existing in Europe. And I would like you to invite all of you today uh, and colleagues uh, interested in IMI to be part of this uh, process, of this review process, uh, to help us uh, identify the areas where partnerships will continue to make a difference in the future, a difference on Europe's research and innovation agenda, but a difference also in uh, Europe's and member states' public policies in the health sector. So please contribute. The process will now start um, after the summer and take this opportunity to look at how you see IMI delivering and don't shy away from recommending, identifying and recommending where you believe that IMI, despite its high impact and state of maturity, 
could do things even better. I very much hope that this will be a, a useful process. It will be further discussed in the proceedings this afternoon. And I think it is um, an <coughs> extremely important uh, next step uh, for the future of innovative medicines in Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Jean-Marie and Thank you for uh, hosting uh, these events. Uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, honor to be here in this particular place, which is a, a great uh, symbol of what you have mentioned, uh, a quite unique uh, public-private partnership. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to be, uh, to be here with you today and celebrate these innovati innovative medicine initiatives. And those of you who have been at the origin of, uh, of these initiatives, you can be really uh, proud of what you have achieved because there were many hurdles in the beginning and when you see where is your baby today 10 years later I think you can be very pleased with uh, with where we are IMI sets out to address very complex societal demand and challenges in medicine developments and evolving healthcare system uh, to make sure that we can achieve progress in areas where no single organization would be able to resolve by themselves. And the success of the initiative rely on this ability to work together and to use a unique collaborative model to deliver outstanding results, which are aligned between Europe and industry priorities. And Jean-Rick, you are mentioning industry commitments and commitments to um, deliver some results. I think you will see this afternoon, you have seen in the in the past of the outcome of the project, this uh, outcome that have been unprecedented and are still today unique in the world. The objective and the outcome of the projects have been transformative for the industry and we are aligned with policies uh, orientations and clearly with the aim to demonstrate value for the society and have a positive impact for patients. It expands the boundaries of pre-competitive collaborative research and heads of new business model. And it makes sounds pretty simple today that competitors accept to share what they have in common in order to accelerate growth and to accelerate science and discovery. But at that time, it was a revolution. It enables faster translations of knowledge into industrial processes and global regulatory standards that benefit both public and private researchers. And last but not least, it delivers new solutions to patients by paving the way to new treatment, vaccine, diagnostics, enrolling patients into clinical trial, and provide patients faster and better uh, access to healthcare. IMI continue to be at the cutting edge of the innovations by maintaining a unique value propositions with bringing competitors together, exposing their research, ability to build on each other, sharing resources that in the past would have been considered competitions pri privately and competitive and proprietary. It brings also researchers, academia, patients, regulators, public um, people together and to manage to the different conflict of interest that potentially have been there to try to work together and making sure that we can accelerate the science and the discovery. And in the end, it's a clear translational objective that provide scale results that are validated by the usage that the companies and um, other um, industries are able to deliver and to leverage. So IMI started as a technology platform and IMI now is evolving into a more integrated and a more global open space of innovation. We would like to further enhance partnership across sectors and areas to allow a better connections and to be more effective and efficient into competitive healthcare systems in Europe. We want to continue to enhance health outcomes and we want to continue to facilitate the patient's journey and the patient's relevance of what we are doing. Make the best of the patient's inputs in the way we design research, in a way we are working together and in a way we can learn from each other in an open and collaborative way. Today, 
Collaboration is not anymore a choice, it is a must. Today, open research, open science to benefit for the, to create a better benefit for the society is something that we need to learn and develop despite the hurdles and despite some past habits. It's very important that we can be able to do that in a safe and neutral platform like the Innovative Medicine Initiatives where new collaborations and new models have been tested for the last 10 years. So we celebrate today, if you have seen that in the, in the short movie from an introduction, we celebrate today 10 years, hundreds of projects, 12,000 researchers who have delivered that collectively and relevant result can be achieved by working together and create in Europe a platform that can be recognized and appreciated in all of the world. So the pharmaceutical industry is committed towards this initiative. The pharmaceutical industry wants to continue to build on this partnership model. And I'm very pleased and honored to be here with you and share the day with you in this afternoon to learn more on how IMI projects have been able to deliver the outcome that we are expecting. And I'm looking forward to the plenary discussion and the visit to the exhibition area to know more about what Europe can create when we are all together and in an open matter. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, they're taking it away. I'll just have to stand and wave about. Um, we just heard there about collaboration being essential, and we're going to continue with that theme because now we're going to talk about what IMA has changed or delivered. And the next session is called Driving Medical Innovation Through Public-Private Partnerships. And I'm going to welcome several people to the stage. And if you could come up just when I mention your name. Michael Goldman, or sorry, Michelle Goldman, founder and co-director of the Institute for Interdisciplinary Innovation in Healthcare and former IMI Executive Director. Pierre Mullien, Executive Director of IMI. Jonathan Knowles, PhD, a professor and board member at Herantus Pharma and Emmanuel Anon, CSO GSK Bio for Vaccine Story. I'll move to the end so that you all have a place to sit. So what we, have we got enough there? Yep, yep, there we go, there we go. Right, so what we're going to do in this session is each of the panelists is going to speak for about a minute to set out the stall. Now this is the point where you come in, um, you can ask questions in this session. So if you've got something burning once we've finished, with these opening uh, statements, please put your hand up and we'll take your question. Otherwise, these poor gentlemen will be subjected to me asking them questions. So make sure you get your questions in. Shall we start at the end? Let's start. Would you like to make your statement first? So welcome, everybody. My name is Emmanuel Anon, and, and I'm responsible of research and development at GlaxoSmithKline vaccine. So my job basically is to make possible new vaccines so, and I need to have a strategy of innovation, and that's made of building an organization, um, investing in future technologies, and establishing very strong partnership. And so in that context, actually the creation of IMI 10 years ago has been something that actually dramatically accelerated that, and really is really part of our innovation strategy. So, I can summarize in few words the key advantage of what has been happening over the last 10 years. So first of all, these consortia have delivered um, really the creation of a critical mass of expertise around specific topic. If I take the example of BioVac Safe, really it's an example where really actually the top science in understanding really how vaccine works and specifically the side effect of vaccine and predicting that was extremely useful. Another advantage has been to actually create really a, an additional level of competency around, for example, clinical testing. I mean, the vaccine um, tested, the Ebola vaccine that have been tested in a very specific situation clearly illustrate uh, that. The third advantage really has been to bring together the fragmented knowledge sometimes that exists on a specific field. Um, so another initiative consortia, Periscope, really allowed really to put together all the knowledge on a specific um, 
this is problematic, so <coughs> Pertusis, and even import actually great knowledge coming from the United States. So that's another example where we can really see the advantage. And, and last but not least, actually, also um, the, some of these initiatives, like the Drive Initiative, for example, really enabling open and transparent communication on, for example, post-licensure commitment and the documentation of um, effectiveness of uh, the use of vaccines, specifically in that case of influenza vaccine. So great, great uh, things that have been delivered. Few little challenge. I think it's important to continue to work on the IP framework, yes, and um, also making sure that we can expand from a disease to technologies uh, point of view. Thanks. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Um, moving along, Jonathan. Yeah, my name is Jonathan Knowles, and in this context, the only relevant qualification is that I'm the founding chairman of the IMI board. Uh, I would also claim to be one of the two fathers of IMI, and the other one is Octavi Quintana Trias. I don't know if he's joined us. Uh, um, and uh, so I thought I'd say a couple of words of how all this started. So uh, two things happened. Two things came together. About 15, 16 years ago, I was asked to become chairman of the FBIA Research Directors Group. And that was a group set up by FBIA because uh, there was a great deal of concern about the image of the pharmaceutical companies, pharmaceutical industry, where uh, the pharmaceutical industry at that time was below tobacco, uh, right at the bottom. And a number of us, particularly those of us in research and development, felt that uh, as, as, an, as organizations, we were not doing our best to partner and convey to society uh, the scientific and medical contributions that we were making. That was the foundation. I, I, um, Trevor Jones set this up. I was asked to take over this. Uh, at the, around the same time, I was also asked to become chairman of, of a group called the HEVA Group. That is an informal group of all of the major R&D heads uh, for all of the major companies uh, around the world um, who meet once or sometimes more a year. And so I then had a very good opportunity of, within the global pharmaceutical industry of bringing together the R&D leaders. That was one thing that happened. The other thing that happened was about this time, slightly earlier, the commission had become concerned about the gr ongoing reduction of, of industrial, of commercial R&D investment across Europe. Uh, uh, and because a lot of this investment was now increasingly going to the states and then increasingly to Asia. And so the commission was concerned, well, this is fine. Can we do something practical to stop this? And so uh, Octavi and I had these uh, very robust meetings. Uh, one of them, he looked me in the face and he said, are you for real? Are you, can you do this? And I said, well, let's try. Uh, and so what, what we were, what we, intended to try was to create a space for partnership, as uh, the former speaker just described, that was unique in the world. This is a very brave thing. We had 28 pharmaceutical companies that we had to get aligned, and then we had to get the commission aligned on a completely different separate funding mechanism. Uh, and neither of those two p groups uh, were particularly interested in this particular partnership. Nevertheless, uh, actually driven by Arini, who's sitting just there, Karima and Karen, who's somewhere, the, the three, there she is, uh, three extraordinarily powerful people uh, with a bit of um, passion and vigor from myself and Octavi. Basically, uh, we were able to put together this extraordinary and unique partnership. And it's unique because it's not just about industry and academia. Uh, it's about all stakeholders, as was mentioned, particularly bringing the regulators in. The FDA is still a paying, FDA is still a paying contributor. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> to, uh, yeah, this could go on forever, it won't. <laughs> we, could, we could take a lot of this, I think, anyway, in the questions yeah, and we'll answers. Do it. Fine. Thank you Anyway, the point is, point is, uh, <laughs> big challenge, uh, off we go. And I, I think from my perspective, I was very keen to have this partnership. My personal perspective was because I was very concerned about the disconnect between academia and industry and the arrogance on both sides. And that is why, and this is important to remember, this is less true today, that's why we said to industry, this is in-kind participation. You will not just pay the money and go off and do what you're doing before. You will come and you will participate and you will work with academia in order to understand better. 
There's lots of other stuff. Anyway, <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm surprised and delighted to be here. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jonathan. Pierre, yes, I, I want you to run, uh, round up at the end of it. So, Michelle, if you could come next. Thank you. So, thank you. So I'm primarily a medical doctor, and the reason why I joined IMI is that because I was convinced that public-private partnership were essential to better serve patients and then uh, society. So since the very beginning, our action was guided by the willingness to mobilize collective intelligence by bringing together and building trust, which is essential, between the different stakeholders. And indeed, as Jonathan said, it's, it's much more than just bringing industry and academia together. This has been done for a while. It's bringing all stakeholders and starting with patients' organization. We need to empower patients. We need to take advantage of the agility of small, medium-sized enterprise. And indeed, we, we have to take on board regulators and payers. And I'm sure that this afternoon you will all realize that over time, and especially under the leadership of uh, Pierre under IMI2, uh, indeed major objectives were, uh, were achieved. Now, um, we are facing new challenges. And that's why, indeed, IMI is involving. And there are many new challenges, including, which becomes more and more important, the affordability of breakthrough therapies from a patient perspective, from a government perspective, and uh, obviously also from the industry perspective. And that's why I'm convinced that we need IMI now more than ever. Thank you very much indeed. And Pierre, 10 years under the belt, where are we and what are you looking forward to? <clears throat> Well, thank you. Um, I, I think the first thing to say is that uh, in Europe, you know, uh, we have some brilliant uh, minds in our uh, academic universities. Uh, we've created a lot, a lot of knowledge that has gone nowhere. And we have to find new models where innovation can actually be uh, created and translated into, uh, into use. And uh, this is why I am such a fan of IMI, because it is an integrative model. So we have everyone where, uh, from research to user, uh, and I believe that it's, this is the only way we can uh, get our brilliant ideas in Europe into clear innovation and ec economic and social value in, uh, in Europe. Thank you very much. Has anyone on the floor got a question? Please put up your hand. Okay, at the front here. And could you say who you are and uh, who you'd like your question to go to? You can, I think, push your microphone button and this button by your microphone. Just push the button and there you go. I'm finding the button. Okay, that was an interesting okay. technology, Berg. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, innovation. Um, so my question is, is, so first of all, I'd like to thank the IMI for <coughs> supporting my uh, nice uh, autism uh, project. Um, the question that I have is really, writ is really around sustainability. So we create beautiful things like a, cre like a um, clinical trial network um, that needs to be used, will be used, but on the long run, I'm, I have to see how that will uh, still uh, able to survive uh, in the absence of possible uh, new project. Um, that's, a, that's a major thing that I'm concerned about if I look at my projects. Jonathan, you look like you're <laughs> jumping to take that question. Hello, yes. It's a very good question. Uh, m my feeling is that in the 10, I don't know how long your, that program has been running, but several years, in that program, if you have been successful in defining molecular mechanisms and patient subgroups, then you have created sustainability. Because the problem that the industry faces is that, is that because of a lack of information about which patients might respond to which drug, industry continues, uh, for all sorts of other pressures, to run large-scale studies where they get mediocre responses. And so, so the continuity is in the science and medicine of each program to bring to identify the different subgroups of patients and an understanding of which molecular mechanisms, in combination or whatever, could be used to treat these patients. If you have that, there's absolutely continuity. 
And if we don't, then we have to take another pause and keep going. And I see that question, by the way, was from Will Sporan, who's been who will be talking to us a little bit later about his subject. And Leif Group, you've got a question. Yeah. Just to follow up on this issue here, because I've also been involved in quite a few of the diabetes projects. And clearly, sustainability, we have been generating a huge amount of data. But the sustainability means that we need to maintain that database and have it open for people, the, for the science community to use. And it actually costs a little bit of money. It's not expensive. It's much more expensive to redo the experiments. But I think we have in the future to take this into account, have a sustainability budget. Yeah. Please, please, Pierre. Indeed, a big, uh, a big topic of conversation. Our uh, science committee is extremely interested in, uh, in, in looking at that. They've just actually uh, put a paper forward uh, for recommendations to, to the board and how IMI should be looking at this. But uh, I think just coming on from what Jonathan was saying, you know, we, we, and we have to insist on sustainability plans and development plans being part of the project. Um, because we can also be creating stuff that nobody wants, right? And we don't want to sustain those. So we need, we need to understand who the users of whatever is being created, who those people are, and maybe they're willing to chip in uh, some, some money to sustain those. I think there are, the other issue you're raising, though, is a more fundamental one about the fragmentation that we have around uh, databases and, and how we organize those across Europe. And that's an even bigger uh, issue uh, that, uh, that we need to address. Pierre, thank you. We had a question right at the back, the lady at the back. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Roxanne Feller, and I come here as an explorer. I represent Animal Health Europe, and we're the animal side of veterinary medicines. So we do the same thing for uh, animals that you do for humans. And we're, we're not as lucky as you to have an IMI. Uh, but we're looking to see how first, step by step, we can actually get our companies to talk to each other. And uh, I heard before Mr. Jean-Christophe Tellier, but maybe uh, Jonathan Knowles or any one of you in the panel now can give me one or two tips on how you manage to overcome the conflict of interest and the competitive and competition issues. Because we're still at that stage, although we'd had an ETP, but it kind of, you know, melted away, unfortunately. So I would be very happy and would value your, your tips for, for Thank for you, that's a very, a very good question. So the lessons learned, I suppose. So what I can say is that since the very beginning to develop a new type of toxicology has been really at, at the core of IMI and uh, both in the industry and the academic sector, we have really leaders in the fields which develop new tools, for example, computerized model, avoiding the need for animals to look at the heart toxicity of uh, potential drugs. And I recently met with someone from the Johns Hopkins which also work on that, and he told me how important the collaboration with IMI and the ETOX project was to, in order to move forward. So I think that, in a way, IMI uh, did already a lot to try to save uh, and to spare animal lives and, and to use animals in a more clever manner and uh, also to take advantage of the new tools, including artificial intelligence, to address in a completely new way the uh, safety of drugs. And just over to Jonathan. D Jonathan, just as you're taking the microphone, does that address the question of, of putting together another body, this time for animals? Yeah, that's, mm. that's what I understood the question was. And, and so, uh, if we go back to IMI, what, what you would need to do is to find the concerns of the industry companies, the companies in that sector. And so in the context of the pharmaceutical industry, everybody, all of the companies were and still are very concerned about their, their, the efficiency with which they create new medicines. So if you could have that discussion with the, the veterinary producers, and, and you'd probably find that was their concern, and then you explain to them that actually there are big questions that none of them can answer by themselves and there is a non-competitive space where if they work together, they can collectively create an environment where all of them to flourish. And if they don't work together, then that environment won't, won't exist and therefore uh, their particular businesses will suffer. So that's the 
fundamental of how thank you get there. Thank you very much for that. We're unfortunately out of time on this panel, but don't forget you've got the networking afterwards, so you'll be able to grab people and ask them more questions. I think what we've heard here are the challenges facing uh, setting up such a public-private partnerships, and also, as Emmanuel said, all of this at the end of the day is to empower patients. Please thank the panel. So we're moving on to our next session, and we're looking at better patient outcomes in diabetes. And this is going to feature BEAT, DKD, Rhapsody, and Summit. And joining me um, on the platform here is a gentleman who was speaking a little earlier, Leaf Group from Lund University IMI Diabetes Projects, and Jochen Maas from Sanofi. Gentlemen, please come, come in. So, a lot of people, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people about this, and is, there, is it possible to have uh, a totally individual approach to diabetes? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, the diabetes is probably one of the fastest increasing diseases worldwide. We have all the forecasts have been exceeded by reality, and we're probably more than 500 millions in the world. But Ever since the biggest discovery in the field of diabetes, insulin, 100 years ago almost, we have been diagnosing diabetes by measuring one metabolite. Of course, 1921 diabetes was rare, but it's quite clear everyone who's taking care of patients knows that it's not one size fits all, they are clearly different. So, and that was, did we have that slide up there? Can I can see it here, yeah. I mean, a few months ago, we published an attempt to do it, and it's just in, not only measuring one <laughs> glucose, but adding five simple other variables that can be measured at all clinics and at the GPs. Clearly, the answer was when we then fed them into a computer, how many forms of diabetes do we really have? And the answer was five, and it has now been replicated in about... Uh, six, seven, eight different cohorts. But the key thing was that, without going into details, the gray one overlaps with type one, the blue one was completely hidden, it's very similar as type one, insulin deficient, poorly treated by drugs. The third one, the most insulin resistant one, has the highest risk of developing diabetic kidney disease, whereas the blue one of diabetic eye disease. So, yeah, this is only a first step. We have now to take it further, and that's what we're really doing in Rhapsody and Beat, to further refine this first, I mean, step towards precision medicine in diabetes. But we need these projects for that. You mentioned the, the numbers of people there. I mean, if you just look at the figures, as you say, 60 million in the European region, that's 10.3% of men and 9.6% of women aged 25 and over. Um, Jochen, if I could come to you, what, uh, what benefit is there of joining forces, particularly for patients? Look at the IMI situation. I think we have we have to to see clearly two achievements we achieved so far. Uh, the first one is uh, a more soft achievement, and the second one is a more uh, yeah hard achievement demonstrated by KPIs, etc. First of all, uh, the example for the soft one. Uh, I think we have to be aware, if we work uh, in the scientific community, we have completely different cultures of scientists. We have uh, the academia, the academic scientists, we have the small and medium companies, we have the uh, biotech companies, and we have uh, big pharma. And even within big pharma, the cultures are quite different. And if we look at this situation, uh, different cultures often create mutual prejustices. And mutual prejustices are uh, yeah, poison uh, for uh, science at the end. And I think the first soft achievement uh, from uh, EMI uh, was really to overcome 
these mutual prejudices by asking people to work together. And I can tell you, if you ask people to work together closely, uh, mutual prejudices will disappear within four weeks. And it's not only, as addressed before, to ask the big pharma uh, to do their in-kind con contributions. It's much more. I, I think we can really learn from each other. This means big pharma can learn from academia. Big pharma can learn from uh, biotech companies. On the other hand, they can learn from us as well. This means we have to, to really say this is one big achievement of uh, EMI. And the second one, and now I'm coming to your question regarding the, question, uh, the, the patients. Of course, we have hard KPIs as well. I give you one example. Uh, in a, a project which was called Emedia, uh, we had the situation that we worked with the beta cells and the beta cell biology. Beta cells are the cells in your pancreas producing insulin and glucagon. Uh, and uh, those, uh, to understand the beta cell biology better uh, creates a lot of opportunities to treat diabetic patients. And in this context, we really achieved hard uh, KPIs. For example, we developed the first human cell line uh, of beta cells. We developed uh, a lot of animal models which are used all around Europe now, both in academic institutions and in uh, big pharma and in small biotech companies. This means we have have really clear KPIs for the benefit of research, and the benefit of research will be the benefit of the patients tomorrow. Better outcomes then for the patients because of the partnership. Better outcomes for patients because of this partnership. I mean, that's clear. I mean, why patients uh, participate in studies and trials is not to boost the career of a researcher. They want to get a better <laughs> health care for themselves. And a clear but of course, when it comes to diabetes, one of the big problems really has been that we have not really understood what diabetes is. But if we, for instance, if we take the, the blue subgroup here, today, I mean, physicians follow national guidelines, and this is being called type 2, and they give them metformin, which doesn't work. And so today we have always been one step behind, but what we hope in the future is that you could be one step before and prevent things. So I hope, but we are not there yet. Therefore, we need these IMI projects. Um, Jochen, what, give us a, a sense of the sort of end-to-end -end approach from the discovery to the outcomes in research. I, uh, as, as, as addressed before, uh, I think the, the, the holy grail uh, in the diabetes research at the end uh, is not only to treat diabetes, this is the current situation, uh, but to cure diabetes. And if we want to cure diabetes, we have to understand uh, all the, the, the background and the pathology of the disease completely. We are not uh, at this stage today. We do not really understand why uh, some diabetic patients develop a complication like diabetic nephropathy after three years, others not after 20 years. Uh, we do not really understand it today. And uh, uh, it's really important to clarify verify the reasons completely and then to switch to the next step uh, and to come to a situation where we are perhaps able to cure diabetes. Could be using stem cells, could be using specific devices, etc. But we have to think uh, from the beginning uh, to the patient and to the situation of the patient. And this includes as well to ask patients what do you really want and not asking only scientists what is your next time. I'm gonna yes, here. something yeah. to get in there. <laughs> and even more, we even could try to prevent the disease because one of our next steps now is to try to identify these individuals in the pre-diabetes or disease mm -hmm. stage because for diabetes, we know that it's an interaction between, I mean, genetic predisposition and environment and it's the environment that has changed hugely. So it, there's a lot of things that can be done in terms of prevention. If you, if you could say just in a couple of words, given the success of collaboration, what would not have been achieved? What in that collaboration would have been missing if you hadn't joined forces? The size. 
I mean, the, the amount of data we have been able to generate is, I think it's, a, we think about often that uh, my project would be a discovery project, it's not. It's we generate together resources and the harvesting time might be in the next IMI project, but these are so valuable resources. But I, uh, one thing I would like to say to the people that it, it's clear also milestones and deliverables are important. But if we still, after five, six years, do what we plan to do six years earlier, then we should not be in science, because then <laughs> there's no, be no innovations that would change. So we need a little bit more flexibility in the future. And Joachim, what would we have yeah, missed? There is, there, there is one other point to be taken into consideration, uh, and this is that the diabetic patient of tomorrow will not need only longer, uh, uh, only drugs. Uh, they will need individual solutions for their individual situation. And this includes, uh, as addressed before, not only drugs, it includes diagnosis, it includes devices, because normally we are working with biologicals. Uh, it includes, of course, drugs furthermore, and it will include uh, data, data management, digitalization as well. And uh, I think what should be uh, in, the, in the scope of EMI a little bit more than in the past is to bring these <coughs> uh, sorry, to bring these four industries, diagnosis industry, drug industry, uh, device industry, and data management closer together than they were before, because the patient of tomorrow will need solutions, not only drugs. And on that, would you please thank our panel? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So the right treatment for the right patients, and this is going to be a bit of a theme, I think, this afternoon. And as the mother of a type 1 diabetic, I find that extremely interesting, also extremely encouraging for the future. And I know things don't happen overnight. Let's move to asthma. I've got one of those in the family as well, so I'm getting lots of information this afternoon. The right treatment for the right patient in asthma. Please welcome Scott Wagers from Life Sciences Open Innovation Catalyst Bioscience Consulting, and Val Hudson, Director of BV Hudson Consulting Limited, patient representative. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I think probably we'll start at the, in the same place. Can we personalize asthma treatment? Well, I think, that's, Just good. I think, that's, I think that's a very good question. Um, we have a slide, and you know, the challenge with any of these projects, and particularly with asthma, is that everyone has a sense and they know that, that there's this heterogeneity, that it's multiple different diseases, but we weren't getting anywhere for that, and no one could really make that threshold, that critical mass. And so what we set out to do in Ubiopred was, you know, there was the clinical clustering that had happened, but now to take a look at the molecular signatures. And this is kind of what you're seeing here on this slide here, is that you see that the groups you have here are perhaps roughly what you think clinically, but if you look in there, there's 10 groups in total. And we maybe had three or four groups clinically. And this is done by combining multiple different omics signatures. So genomics is one thing, but also proteomics, metabolomics, breath omics. And we combined all those together to now come up with 10 subgroups. The really interesting thing about that is that these are based, and you can draw mechanisms out of this, mechanisms that you can then use to drive new therapies and new treatments and actually for the new biologics that are on the field to actually target so subgroups, which is really the goal. And what you're seeing here is a clustering technique that's using topographical analysis to then separate the patients out in a very clear fashion, as you see here. Key is, this is only just the beginning. This is just one sputum sample with proteomics, and there are gonna be multiple different layers. And we get around 16, eight to 16 clusters when we do it all together. You know, the key is that this is still, a, you know, a ways to go. We're now in the efforts of driving that into the clinical practice. Mm. But yet, there's still value coming out of this today because I've just learned beginning of this week that the data set in Ubiopred, which is very rich and robust, the best data set in this way in, in, in the world in, in asthma, is being accessed about 82 times a month by researchers to help drive internal questions, shape projects, validate other cohorts. So that's a really important thing. And, you know, Ubiopred ended three and a half years ago, but it's been sustained. It's been, it was supported by the European Restoration Society for three years, and now we're in a situation where 
a core of the partners are getting together to sustain it, to develop the next project on their own, which is really interesting. And, and of course, that in research and other researchers, that becomes like a cycle then, and you're getting more research in as well. Exactly. And, and the thing is, what, what I want to point out is that this is very difficult. This was extremely difficult and still remains difficult. But we have a secret sauce, a, a, a sort of a way of doing this, and, and that's sitting next to me. And that, that's the patients, because <laughs> they were deeply engaged in Ubiopred. And when the going got tough, they got up and said, well, come on, get on with it. And, and that motivated everybody. And, and from my role of helping to keep the project running, I know that was a very big, big well, factor. Let, let's, let's hear from Val. Um, what's in it for the patients, then? What are you hearing, Val? OK, so at the moment, most patients with severe asthma will tell you that while the treatments may alleviate the symptoms, the treatments themselves can also cause massive problems. So I give two examples. Steroids, oral steroids, can cause osteoporosis. Inhaled steroids can cause cataracts. And we don't even know that those treatments are working for everyone. So, be a, so by being able to target the different types of asthma, you'll hopefully be able to target the treatments and to drive the drugs to treat your asthma, treat my asthma, rather than just taking a kind of wild guess at what treatments work mm. for what patients. What is the power of the patient, do you think, in all of this research? We talk about collaboration between all these other groups, but what is the power of the patient? OK, so when we started Ubiopred, I have to say, I think the patients were really quite scared of the clinicians, of industry, of the scientists. Um, but we could see, and people have talked about collaboration, and I think that's one of the things that we could see very early on. It was really good to see this group of people coming together and not competing with one another. So although we came in at a slightly later stage than patients perhaps would now, because now one of the things that Ubiopred led to was patients being involved in the research question, being involved right at the beginning, and now most commissioners will insist on that. But one of the things we were able to do were to support, to disagree sometimes, so just something as simple as language. Um, we persuaded the scientists not to call us subjects, but to call us participants, because that kind of changed the power relationship. Um, we persuaded, we negotiated, and I think, as Scott said, we supported. So one of the studies that was going on was trying to find uh, an inoculation for... Um, Right for the rhinovirus, because that's a really crippling kind of thing for a lot of people with asthma. Um, and the scientists and the clinicians were ready to give up, but the patients persuaded them to carry on. They said, look, this is so important to us, because picking up a virus can cripple us for ages, leads to oral steroids, leads to the kinds of problems we were talking about. And so in that particular instance, the study continued. Uh, just get, just, I'm going to let you come back in, Scott, but just a few figures for you. In Europe alone, about 30 million children and adults less or under the age of 45 have asthma, and about 10% of adults with asthma have severe asthma, which is very difficult to treat. Um, so you listened to them and you took the patients and you took their advice, did you? Yeah, well, I, th I think one of the, the, the key things that we, we did in the project, which is pretty novel and unique, is that the patients came to the work package meetings. They were on the conference calls and we were talking about, you know, this decision whether to go ahead with developing the clinical um, exacerbation model with the virus. You know, they were there and, and people said, well, maybe they won't understand it. But in, in the last meeting we had under the funding period, we asked the patients, you were involved in different things, you know, all, all kinds of parts of your biopred. If we were to do it again, what would you like to be involved in? Their answer was clear, all of it. And, you know, looking at the, at the researchers, that was also their viewpoint. They, they voted and said the best sessions at the meetings were when the patients presented. So there's that synergy, and, and really what they're doing is helping to instill that passion 
that make really ambitious projects diff, uh, you know, hard to do, but it's, the passion really helps you to carry it through. Thank you very much, both of you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> So we've heard of the human side of it there. Let's talk about the value as well of uh, public-private collaboration. Please welcome to the stage Wolfgang Bircher, Deputy Director General, DG Research and Innovation at the European Commission. Arjun Brossard, Scientific Director, Amsterdam Neuroscience. Claire Geary, Deputy Director General, INSERM. Deval Patel, I'll move to the end so you've all got a seat. This is a big one. Okay. <laughs> Musical chairs, Deval Patel, Executive Vice President and Chief Scientific Officer at UCB, and Corinne de Vries, thanks Corinne, um, who's Head of Science and Innovation Support at the European Medicines Agency. So we're talking about the value of public private collaboration. Can you put a price on it? Who would like to take that question first? I'm just going to, you're all going to get a, a moment to speak, but I just want to set the stage where can you actually put a price on it? Thank you very much. Firstly, I think for a public funder, this is very important to know <clears throat> what is the added value mm. of public-private partnerships, and in particular, the added value at European level. Now, if you have listened to all the contributions which we have heard until now, is that the added value is really bringing together partners that normally would not work together. And this has added value in many respects, and I come to your question, the price. Firstly, I think it pools financial resources, but it does not only pool financial resources, but it liberates financial resources that otherwise would not be available for research and innovation. And if you just look at the case of, of, um, of IMI over the last years, both IMI 1 and 2, this has liberated additional funding for research and innovation of about 3.5 billion euros, which otherwise would not be necessarily available for research and innovation. That's quite astonishing. Um, we're going to go, we're not going to do the questions, we're going to go along the panel and ask each of them to do a minute, and then you will get to ask your questions in this session as well. Would you like to start? Thank you. So, uh, on my point of view, which is the point of view of a research performing organization involved in health research in France, uh, I, th I will uh, answer to your question more on added value of this kind of partnerships. And, uh, of course, my everyday work is uh, maybe thinking of how to give incentives to academic research to answer some global questions and some society-related questions. And I wanted to give you, let's see, illustration. <laughs> An example on the EBOVAC uh, projects, they are presented, I think they will be presented in detail in the afternoon, so you can see the, the groups about that. But uh, I wanted to, to give this example because I think it's very interesting, uh, because it combines the targeted approach of industry and the efficiency and the flexibility of the industrial approach on that and the academic, uh, the excellence of and quality of academic research and being able in a context of, of the Ebola crisis, of, uh, of a sanitary crisis, to be able to combine those advantages and to those characteristics to, so that people work together on a targeted approach on this specific event with a with, in a very short time frame was very important. Thank you very much. You can go last. <laughs> yes, um, so I present the two uh, Amsterdam University Medical Centers. Uh, we've been participating in uh, um, um, different uh, EMI projects, but in particular also in the EPAT project, which is focused on Alzheimer's disease, which is a devastating disease. I said to Maxime earlier on, it's, it's hot, it's urgent, mm -hmm. but it's manageable, and we think it's manageable only in an, uh, in an open innovation. So the value for, um, for academia, actually, to work with industry is that we lack one asset, and that is the generation of novel chemical structures, novel medicine. We need medicinal chemistry expertise from industry. We have m guided access to patients. We have a lot of ideas about disease mechanisms, but we need the tools in order to, uh, to do the interventions. Vice versa, I think the value for uh, IMI type of projects, uh, PPI projects, 
are is that the the trial design can be done better. I think the robust trial design is sometimes a little bit old-fashioned, and especially we see that with small biotech companies, they are very uh, courageous. They are uh, focusing more on, on substrate, on biomarkers, and so they're looking for novel outcome measures, and we give guidance uh, in that trial design. Deval. Thank you very much. I'd like to follow up on what Jonathan Knowles said earlier. My job is to make medicines. And the value of these private and public partnerships has been not only what you set this up for, which was how can we as industry do it better when we work together, but is how can we as a community do it better together. And where I have seen the most value created is not only when uh, industry works with academia, but also with regulators, and I think we'll hear some of that later today, and with patients. And in those settings, I think we've had tremendous impact. And the value generated is really hard to measure. I mean, we can try in economic terms, but the value that has been created has been tremendous. And, and I very much appreciated your comment about subjects versus participants. And I think this is a big change also. Um, so I think we've created much more than financial value. But Pierre, to follow up, um, I really resonated with your comments about trying to make this even more um, uh, impactful from an economics standpoint. And I hope that our next versions will help do that better. Deval, thank you. Corinne. Thank you. So it's my privilege um, to be on the Science Committee of IMI as a representative of the EMA, and it's also, I feel very privileged to be here. So um, when we as EMA think about what is the value of public-private partnerships, we actually don't think in monetary terms. We think about public health impact. And to us, the question really is, and it comes at the Science Committee as well, how do you really achieve the greatest public health impact and where do where does a public private partnership have the best impact on public health and of course recognizing the 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 the, the need for the private sector to benefit from this but where is it really really the most valuable and to us it really is well it needs to address a problem that has to be tackled and it wouldn't be tackled if it were not for the public private nature of the work mm -hmm. And we, we see a lot of that here today, and it's, it's great to be here at this 10-year celebration for that, and I look forward to, looking at, to discussing some of it at, at the exhibitions. To me, one really nice example of what IMI is about to fund is a drug safety and pregnancy project. And to me, it really speaks to um, a whole range of challenges, needs to be tackled, wouldn't be tackled if it weren't for this particular funding mechanism. FPA has been successful in getting many pharmaceutical companies together to really bring all the expertise and, and, and resource from industry together. Likewise, in academia, people have decided not to compete, but everybody came together, and so there was only one consortium that bid for it. And in that consortium, they're really already approaching us as regulators to make sure that what they deliver, A, is sustainable, and B, meets the needs to, for the data generated to make it into labels so that drug safety information or drug information no, no longer just says consult your doctor and the doctor also doesn't know. No, it really is what data needs to be generated for us regulators to be happy for the commercial organizations to give that data to patients. I know I need to be finishing. Um, <laughs> But to, to me, it's a, it's a beautiful example, and it's very promising. And what I'd like to plead to this audience is we've seen some of the IMAP projects come to regulators for dialogue, because if you're talking about novel trial designs, biomarkers to select certain patients, we need to understand why suddenly we have these novel trial designs, or why you're selecting only certain patients, and so on. We, only, we don't see enough of you. So we try to encourage you, come early, enter into a dialogue with us, and, um, and then there's undoubtedly much exciting 
ahead. Thank okay, you. so given that overview, Wolfgang, what, what, I suppose in a way it's bringing us to the question, doesn't it, where does PPB <laughs> deliver the greatest value? Uh, just, uh, you might have got the impression that the European Commission is only interested in cash and in money because <laughs> I put a price on it. But evidently we are very, well aware of the added value of joint undertakings and IMI in particular because as we have seen this whole uh, afternoon now, we pool resources, financial resources, human resources. And what is the result of this in terms of added value? It improves the quality of science, the excellence of science. It improves the relevance of science. And as uh, Pierre has indicated, translation of science in daily use. And I think as a first element, in a fourth element in terms of added value, it ensures synergies and, uh, and, uh, and cost savings at the level also of industry. Because I think uh, the most impressive thing is that, as, as, as Jean-Christophe has said, it extends the scope of pre-competitive collaboration between uh, the industry. So I think all these elements really constitute key elements for added value. Questions from the audience, yes. Uh, Leif, you've had one. I'm going to make you second, this gentleman over here. Yeah. Hello. Um, my name is Sebastian Genzi. I'm Managing Director of Global Health Access Solutions. And we talked a little about sustainability and value. And I'd like to take us a little bit further um, when we talk about public healthcare systems, if they can actually uptake the innovation once you have developed them. Because that's really, if you look at demographic factors, public healthcare systems at the moment are not prepared to take on these innovations. And this is really what I want to address. We haven't really heard from the insurance perspective and the affordability perspective. Thank you. Who would like to take that? <laughs> Claire, thank you. No, I, uh, it's not really an answer. <laughs> I'm not sure there is a simple answer, but I think you're perfectly right, and I think we're really all turning around this issue. Uh, the next step is, is that, and that's why it's so important to have these public-private partnerships, but also to have the uh, discussion with the regulators, uh, of course, in, a, in organized ways, but I, I think that's really, uh, really very important to, to succeed. Does anyone else want to comment on that, just briefly? Corinne, yeah. I can only echo what you're saying, and we've been accused by payers and, and health technology assessment bodies that we don't want you to approve innovation if we can't pay for it. Um, and we are trying, as we acknowledge the issue, of course, the healthcare, the market doesn't work in healthcare, so we need to think innovatively on that aspect as well. You may be familiar with the uh, parallel sci scientific and, and HTA advice that we offer and try to encourage. It's, it's a long way off. Um, luckily, the Commission is also aware that, that things need to change here and, and is also supportive. I don't, like, my pre like the previous speaker, I don't have the answer. I, I also think, you know, so there's a lot of, in, of focus in, in, in IMI on innovative medicines, and perhaps we also need to, to incorporate um, repurposing of existing medicines and, and, and then think perhaps about novel um, funding mechanisms. Okay, to uh, very that. briefly, Wolfgang, because we've got another um, question. This is a key issue because we are talking about doing research and innovation for our citizens. And this implies that they have to feel the consequences in the healthcare systems. And I think one key issue, and it has been addressed already today, we have considerably extended in, uh, in IMI the, the number of partners. From, from business and academia to end users involving public authorities. And I think if we want the uptake by public authorities who are in charge of healthcare systems, we really need to consider to what extent we can involve also public authorities responsible for healthcare systems in what we are doing in order to ensure this, uh, this uh, uh, value chain in terms of uh, uh, deployment. Jonathan, you have a question. And Leif, then I'm coming to you. Yeah, it's, a, it's a question about innovation. Actually, it's more of a statement, if you'll forgive me. Make innovation, it brief if it's a statement. <laughs> <laughs> innovation, by definition, I mean, industry serves society. It's industry's job to bring innovation to society, which in the current context means it's cost-effective. And I want to say, in cancer, 
where appropriate individualization has been carried out, there are huge cost savings. We're already starting to see it. So from a public health perspective, it's obvious. We just have to do it. Q, you made it brief. Leif. Panel and uh, also a stakeholder in IMI, but you actually mentioned the healthcare providers. I think you missed them here. And when we are discussing precision medicine, we clearly it's a top-down process today, and there is a gap because the users of our precision medicine they must be part of it. So I think we really should much more try <coughs> to involve them. I also look at comments. Would anyone like to address that? It's an interesting point, isn't it? Anyone want to? No. Okay. Another question from the floor? Right at the back. Thank you. Um, Magdalena Pachowska from Turkish Research Office. I'm just having a question about how the partnerships will uh, approach the v um, differences in the gender needs. And I think that the program of today also shows the underrepresentation of the women interests when you have 17 men and five women without counting the moderator. So, <laughs> thank you. Corinne, I see you lifting their microphone there. Count double, but <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, you know, so I think the, the the notion about the healthcare professionals, the notion about gender balance, you know, when we see research going on, and you'll see it in the exhibition, I notice the healthcare professionals are actually recruiting the patients. Uh, the gender balance, to me. Is, is partly represented by this increasing direction to personalized medicine. Women respond differently to some treatments than men, pharmacokinetics are different and so on. So I think, um, you know, while I agree the points are relevant, I also think, yes, they need addressing. Let's not be too harsh on ourselves. And I'll give it to my note. Yep. Maybe I'll address uh, that a little this bit. Is, this is up in the Pandora's box, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, only in that uh, I think uh, perhaps uh, uh, the impact of what industry is doing may be underestimated. And I'll just take one example. Um, uh, just recently, uh, UCB and under Jean-Christophe's uh, uh, leadership just um, uh, got a uh, medication approved that will be more impactful for pregnant or women or women of childbearing age. Um, this is something that I'm not sure would have happened a decade or two ago. Uh, and so I think we are uh, listening to what is being said and trying to uh, develop medicines in a way that will be impactful for society. Very briefly, because I'd like to get another question. Maybe, maybe just one uh, remark about gender balance. Um, I think it's interesting to see that uh, in the Amsterdam University Medical Centers, uh, more than 60% of our residents are female at the moment, and this percentage is increasing. And the same holds true for our uh, biomedical PhD students. I, so I oversee a cohort of about 400 uh, PhD students. Part of them are in an MD PhD project, and the majority is female. So they are coming. Well, we wait, we wait for that day, don't we, ladies? Um, there was a gentleman with a question. Where were you? Someone had, um, yeah, well, go ahead, yeah. Okay, my name is uh, Walter Leuten. Currently working in academia, used to work in uh, drug discovery in the pharmaceutical industry. I still work on drug discovery issues, but uh, the gap between academia and industry is enormous, and I wonder whether IMI could help, for instance, you know, we discover an interesting potential drug target, go to companies, they say, oh, we've got targets coming out our ears. Is it, is it even druggable? Okay, we run a screen, we find some compounds, take those back, they say, yeah, yeah, you got some compounds, but you know, aren't they toxic? So we do some cytotoxicity, we take them out, yeah, yeah, they're not toxic, but yeah, how about genotoxicity? So we run AIMS test, they go back, say, yeah, yeah, well, well, do you have any SCR? you have any structure activity related? We go back and, so we keep being sent back with questions that really we are not the best placed to solve, and we are not even funded to address those issues because they're not considered to be academic research questions. So my proposal is I might could set up a facility, like they've set up a screening platform to help address people. They can just submit a compound and in a tiered fashion, a number of tests that the pharma industry can agree on are relevant to evaluate the 
uh, potential of a compound can be done at such a facility mm. without uh, jeopardizing IP rights. Interesting concept there, Deval. I can actually answer that and say that it happens today. Um, there is the European lead factory funded by IMI that does exactly what you are suggesting. So maybe we need better communication um, and awareness of how to do these things. Um, and also, uh, I think uh, one of the next steps Pierre is probably talking about is to then help you uh, bring that to the clinic. And so I, I think that there are mechanisms, but maybe we can make them better. Thank you very much. I think we've run out of time, unfortunately. Sorry, Claire. Thank the panel, please. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on now to our next session. Uh, and this is really very patient-focused, relieving the pain, what matters to patients. And this is featuring Europain. And joining me on the platform is Jordi Serra, who's Chief Scientific Officer, Neuroscience Technologies, SME, and Mark Fladrich, Chief Commercial Officer of Grunenthal Group. So just while we're settling, uh, just to tell you that chronic pain actually affects an estimated 100 million people across Europe. That's one in five Europeans. And the number it's a number greater than those figures we were quoting for diabetes a little earlier. Mark, set the scene for us. Yeah, the statistics, <clears throat> the statistics you're, quoting, you're quoting are absolutely correct. Um, what I think is uh, also important to know that pain is actually now seen as a disease rather than just um, a symptom of a disease. And I think some of the biggest problems that we have, and actually they have a huge impact on society, are chronic patients with chronic pain. 20% um, uh, of the population of Europe suffers from chronic pain, and roughly 25% of patients will suffer for 20 years or longer. Mm. So if you think about the implications of that on family members, on employment, on productivity, um, it is actually a very big burden in Europe. Um, and it's a burden actually that is uh, getting worse as the population ages because pain becomes um, more uh, difficult to manage as, as patients age and their musculoskeletal systems, etc., start to fail and they also suffer from other uh, problems. So it is quite a burden and it is a big economic burden as well as a burden on patients. And Jordi, what's been achieved? Well, it's been achieved a lot, actually. And, and uh, I think that the, the first thing to understand is that pain is a very complex matter. Everything is a complex matter, of course. If you talk to people that treat Alzheimer, it's a very mm -hmm. complex matter. Asthma is very complex. Pain is very complex, and at the same time, it hurts. <laughs> and that's, that's an important thing. I mean, 20%, if we raise the arms here, our hands here, of how many people are in chronic pain in this simple... Uh, you know, in this simple room here, you, you, you will be amazed. So it's a complex issue, and it's an issue that directly relates uh, to the well-being of, of, of people. Uh, what we have been achieving uh, during these uh, years is quite a lot, and I think that the most important achievement, uh, we could talk a lot about spectacular uh, things that we have been discovering, and spectacular, mm -hmm. you know, results that we have been having in European, that was the consortium we were involved. Uh, we could talk about, you know, placing microelectrodes inside the nerve and picking the electrical signals that are the signals of the pain, so you can now quantify somehow pain. And we could talk about all these achievements. Uh, but I think the greatest achievement has been collaboration. And I think this is a thing that's a topic that reverberates here again and again, how we need to collaborate. Uh, and and this, is, this is the most important thing here. And... Why it's important? It's important because nobody, not even the big pharma companies that are sitting here today, or the small SMEs like I am representing here, or even the patient groups, or even the individual academic scientific, have the answer to this type of problems. This is a thing that can only be achieved mm -hmm. by pure collaboration between all the, all the stakeholders. So if we flip it to the patient side, though, what is the measure of success for them? Their pain goes away. 
their pain goes away. But I think one of the one of the one of the important parts of the collaboration is that we are actually involving three patient patient advocacy groups, um, and it's becoming more and more important that the outcomes for patients are actually dictated by them and prioritised by them. One of the problems that we have in pain research and development is there's, it's actually one of the therapy areas with the highest failure rate. Um, a lot of the mechanisms of action are not understood and there's huge variability between patients how they will react or respond to a particular therapy. So I think from the science side it's very important to try to find tools and methodologies to identify responders but at the same time, we need actually to work actively with patients to help develop the endpoints that are most relevant for them. And given the information that you've, you've had coming in from the collaborations, what are you seeing and what advances are being made? Well, advances, uh, we have always, we need to think about practical implications and practical benefits and for, for the patients, which is at the, at the end what we are all looking for. So, for instance, in European, it was uh, very interesting to see that it's not only that we started a deep and dense collaboration between different academic centers and FBA companies in Europe, is that at the end of the project, for instance, we had an interaction with a European Medicines Agency, seeking advice from them. Uh, this was with the purpose of how are we going to stratify patients in the future for clinical trials. Is this an exercise that is floating there in the air? No, it's a practical exercise because right now there is now a new IMI, pain care, in which we are going to take some of this advice, we are going to do clinical trials, and we are going to see whether all these biomarkers, all these ways that we have to stratify patients will work and will help us in uh, designing new drugs. Is one of the problems the difficulty in actually rationalizing what pain is? Because even the three of us sitting here, we might have a different idea of what pain is for each of us. Yes and no. I think, I think everybody here knows what's pain. If I pinch your hand, you will all agree that's pain. Yes, but in, in, so, terms, of, in terms of strength, you might think, I might think something's a 10, you might think it's a 2. Yes, at the end of the day, what's important is what you think your pain is, uh, because everybody experiences pain in a different way. If you have a 10 of pain with a stimulus in which uh, I only have a 5 of pain, uh, that doesn't mean anything. It's, uh, your system is different than mine. It's uh, at the end of the day is your experience of, of the subjective experience what's important. I think the other, the other issue is to identify pain early and manage it mm. early so it doesn't actually chronify. Because the longer a patient has had pain, the bigger the changes to the, to their, their entire, to the entire organism, if you like, um, different uh, uh, neurological pathways, etc. the more difficult it is actually to treat. So, I think in the diagnostic area, it's also important to recognise which pain conditions could actually qualify because they're much, they have a much bigger impact. So at the end of the day, you need to deliver also to patients' expectations, don't you? Absolutely. And, and expectation, it's very simple in the end. Uh, expectation is, I want to get rid of my pain. Are you hopeful? Are you optimistic that we are moving forward, particularly in collaboration? Um, absolutely, because I think it's actually, uh, I mean, many of the big pharma companies have actually exited pain because it's too hard, too hard basket. I think this collaboration is, is great because we, we are working across the companies that are still interested in the area. We're working with academia, we're working with patient groups, and I think the science today can help us find pointers to actually identify new therapies and, and even to get better value out of the therapies that currently exist. And just a final thought, we have an ageing society. Um, I know my mother in her 80s, for instance, she suffers a lot of pain, arthritis, and so on. Um, it's going to become even more of a, a priority, isn't it? It is. It's, uh, actually, pain is number one complaint when you go to the doctor. Uh, so if we are talking about quality of life and the final user, which is the, 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 the person complaining of pain, we need to relieve. And there are aging populations out there with diseases associated with aging, for instance, diabetes, that may result in uh, catastrophic things like uh, neuropathic pain. This is pain caused by a dysfunction of the, of the nervous system. So yes, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a big problem. Thank you very much indeed.
So we're going to turn now to the many faces of autism. This is featuring the EU AIMS project. And Will Sporan, who you heard asking a question earlier, he's uh, head of behavioral pharmacology and preclinical imaging at the Hoffman La Roche. Will, please join us. And I think uh, we're going to talk about uncharted territory, really, aren't we? In your, That's true. In your, you, you need to grab a microphone there from the table. Because it really is a bit of uncharted territory, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so it's very clear. So when we started our project in 2012, 2013, there was really nothing there that mm -hmm. could support us in terms of um, the targets or any um, <coughs> patients, where were patients were, et cetera, et cetera. So is that a good thing, though? Because you had a clean sheet, really, didn't you? Yeah, but it was also scary. <laughs> so um, so no, not having any guideline or any, any history um, so the whole field is open, so you're not sure what has been tried or how it was done. Uh, so you're sort of inventing the wheel while you're driving. How do you prioritize? Uh, we prioritize for uh, core symptoms. So um, autism um, is defined by core and core symptoms and comorbidities, and core symptoms are repetitive behavior and social deficit disorders. And then there are a host of of uh, comorbidities that include anxiety, depression, uh, seizures, sleep disorders, you name it, it's, it's all there. Do you, do you, what about targeting of patient groups, maybe with a view for personalized medicine? Is that possible within the area? Um, it can be done. So you have uh, autis autism um, in certain, um, certain uh, genetic lines, such as fragile legs, we've, we've been there. Mm. Uh, and so that, that will be an option, yeah. And patient engagement, their contribution in any form of research, I'm assuming it's absolutely vital. That's true, so that it's critical. Uh, and we see that there's a huge engagement. So for example, we have set up a naturalistic observational study with more than a thousand uh, controls and uh, individuals with autism and, the cont and their motivation to come without any benefit because it's not a drug study uh, and deep clinical phenotyping that, that, that will take two days, uh, that commitment was there. So they're absolutely involved actively. And what projects and new projects are we going to see, do you think? Um, in, ter in terms of IMI? Or yeah. So, yeah. So we've started now our second project, um, and that has a very clear fo fo um, change direction. So the, uh, the first po project was all about developing capability, clinical capability, uh, biomarker development, uh, etc. Uh, and now, actually, we are going into drug treatment. So we, uh, the, the consortium, as such, um, will the, will start a, a, a drug study for efficacy. Do you think we take autism and its prevalence within the population as a whole seriously enough? Um, I think it is. We are very serious, and the pop, and the, the world is also quite um, serious about it because it's increasing uh, rapidly. We're not quite understand it, but it's certainly... Uh, uh, and it's, it's an umbrella term in a way, isn't it, for many different forms. Explain that to us. That's, that's very true, and that's why the biomarker development is so critical. Yeah. What will that give us? What will it show that you don't already know? Hopefully, it will allow us to, um, <coughs> to define better the, uh, let's say, the underlying neurobiology. So, so if we go forward with a clinical trial, uh, that we have a more homogeneous group. Are we nearing treatments, do you think? I don't want to use the word cure because it's a very definite thing. But I, I don't think we will have a cure. No. Uh, but um, but FLOS has a molecule going forward and we're phase three. So mm. that's very encouraging. The collaboration, um, we've talked about the patient collaboration, but the collaboration as a whole within Europe, how important is that? Um, so it has been a wonderful experience, I have to say. So the. Uh, the arrogance of the rec of the um, uh, academic people and the arrogance of the industry people have merged really uh, beautifully into a <laughs> wonderful collaboration. <laughs> Very large arrogance. I mean, I actually mean that. Uh, <laughs> and it's, it, it's also, I think it has to do also with the topic because most of us have children and so the motivation is there, absolutely. And without that collaboration, what would we not have now? What have you gained through that? Excuse me? What have you gained over by collaborating that if you, that collaboration had not existed, we wouldn't have? Um, I think about everything because um, 
this, this project is different from what you've seen before. I mean, there was really nothing. So we needed the academics to participate in all of the things that we wanted to um, bring forward as a, uh, as a PDS, as a sort of a, uh, a necessary deliverable as and we, and we as, as, as drug companies could never have done that. So in terms of carry that weight. So you were pushed by the arrogant academics. Yeah, <laughs> we were. <laughs> you, you mentioned at the beginning of this uh, interview that you had no infrastructure. Yeah. You, you had this clean slate. What have you got now? Well, we have, uh, um, we went for quality advice for, for the, by, by the regulators, the EMA, they were very interested. Uh, we had a, they never had a consortium visit like us. We did it in a collaborative manner, and uh, now we have a, a guideline, um, which is the first in the world, I have to say, so that's really good. We have developed a clinical trial network with more than um, 100 sites, mm -hmm. uh, and we have a, um, a database with, uh, about, uh, uh, with data from about 1,000 or 1,500 individuals, controls, and uh, affected. And what's your wish list now going forward? That we have a drug. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we've gone through quite some very interesting topics here this afternoon. Lots of food for thought, particularly for when you're networking uh, a little later on. We are still going to talk about patient empowerment, and in fact, patients themselves empowered, featuring you, Patty. And uh, Lara Bloom, from the international ex who's International Executive Director of Ellen's Daniels Society, is going to join us now. And I'm going to leave the stage to her. You're lucky, Lara. You're getting the, all the bits. It is such an honor to have been invited to speak today to celebrate 10 years of the Innovative Medicines Initiative Transforming Medical Research, especially as at the IMI, patient engagement has been a priority since the beginning. There are so many ways that patients are being failed, especially in rare and chronic diseases, and this is why it is essential that our voice is heard. There is a consistent lack of validation, diagnosis and support. Despite multiple campaigns to raise awareness, there is still the failure to adequately address mental health support to those diagnosed with rare and chronic conditions. I live with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome every day. I do not remember a time when a day in my life did not include pain. I feel it everywhere. It's exhausting and it is at times agonizing. Despite that, I live a full and active life, and I believe that everyone deserves that chance. I am reminded every day how much change is needed and how vital it is to have patients involved with the process that leads to that change. One example of these stories that highlight this importance is a call that I received from a mother of a 13-year-old girl called Lillianne. She had spent years seeking a reason for her chronic pain and multi-systemic symptoms. It had restricted her quality of life both physically and mentally. By the time she finally received her diagnosis of EDS, she was institutionalized in a mental hospital. She felt like she was a burden. She felt like nobody believed her. Her journey to diagnosis had made her sicker than she should have been. One day she was granted a day of leave to go and play with her horses. Her family were hopeful that her smile and good mood were a sign that she was getting better. They were wrong. Her smile was a sign that she was ready to be free of her pain. After leaving Lillianne feeding her horses, her mother returned to find her dead. She had hung herself. She was 13 years old. She could no longer face the pain she felt and she was permanently damaged by the journey that she had gone on before she was diagnosed. When Lillianne's mother called me crying, asking what could she do, how could she make a change? 
It was because of the IMI and their projects that promote patient engagement that I had something to point her to. Very early on in the IMI, a formal patient engagement strategy was put in place, which involved patients in their scientific committee. And in 2014, UPATI was started, developed, and implemented as a flagship project. UPATI is the European Patients Academy on Therapeutic Innovations. And it was the first time I had been given a fully funded opportunity to be trained on developing the tools and knowledge to be able to sit around the table as an equal stakeholder in the medicines research and development process. Something that should be a right and not a privilege. I remember receiving an email from a professor I work with through my position as an executive director of the Ehlers Danlos Society. It was an email telling me that he would like to write a letter of recommendation for me to apply to do the course. Often I'm a lone patient voice in a room full of clinicians and scientists fighting for what would make our life easier. And when I found out that this course would arm me with skills to help me, my apprehension about the time involved was quickly replaced with excitement. I have had the privilege of being a voice for patients for over eight years now. And the understanding that we should be involved in re research and development has not always been there. So I wanted to make the most of this enriching opportunity. And not only does UPATI offer this expert level training, but they also offer and maintain the toolbox in medicine development and coordinate a network of national platforms for patient advocates. They focus on education and training to increase the capacity and, capabili and capability of patients to understand and contribute to medicine's research and development. And also to improve the availability of objective, reliable, patient-friendly information for the public. These resources are game changers for people like me, desperate to make a difference. Back in 2006, the DIA was one among the first organizations to recognize the importance of patient involvement in drug development. And it launched its first patient fellowship program. Since then, the role patients can play in a therapeutic product R&D has exploded. And there are more opportunities than ever before for patient engagement. And this is spearheaded by the IMI with projects like Prefer, which looks at how and when it is best to perform and include patient preference in decision making during the drug life cycle by including patient stakeholders at every level of the project. There are also many more projects where patients work along researchers from challenges in medical research and development. Here, patients contribute their knowledge and skills to the project and are recognized as equal partners. There are also patient organizations investing in IMI as associated partners, allowing them to play an even stronger role in shaping the projects from the start. But despite all this, there is still no clear alignment amongst stakeholders on the nature and value of patient engagement at different points of the medicine's life cycle. Whilst the training that UPATI provides is essential, without engagement, it is useless. And the new IMI project paradigm seeks to provide a bridge between the two. It is led by the European Patients Forum and the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations. And its objective is to participate on the co-creation of a framework allowing systemic, impactful, meaningful, ethical, and sustainable patient engagement. Paradigm is a collective effort of 30 months with all stakeholders involved, from patient groups to regulators, HTA bodies and pharmaceutical companies. And it will focus not only on adult patients, but also on vulnerable populations such as young people and the elderly with dementia. There has never been a better time to be a patient expert. Every year that passes, there are in increasing opportunities tools and resources for patient engagement and inclusion. The value of patient involvement in medicines R&D is increasingly recognized by all stakeholders, but there is still work to do. I turn to you all and ask you to remember the patient voice in every part of the process. Behind every patient expert is a story like Lillianne's, a driving force behind what we do. Please remember, Nothing about us without us. When Lilia's mother called me that day, I remembered another 15-year-old girl, 
A girl who spent her life at school on crutches and in pain with no answers. A girl who always told she was a hypochondriac or unlucky. One day walking home from school, she bumped into the wrong crowd of girls and ended up with a black eye. It was no big deal. It was nowhere near the pain that she felt. But for the next day, for the first time, everybody could see her pain. People asking what they could do. Did it hurt? Remarking on how painful it looked. And she thought, this is nothing. They had no idea how much pain she was in everywhere else. But there was a difference. This pain was visible. A few months later, this girl had had enough. She was in so much pain and nobody understood or believed her. She needed to make her pain visible again so that people could understand. She then did the unthinkable. She ended up beating herself up. She punched herself, slashed her face, and brought to the surface everything that she felt inside. She tried to recreate that moment of understanding that she had when she had the black eye. She went so far that she ended up passing out and waking up in an ambulance. She made her invisible visible. That 15-year-old girl was me. Now, over 20 years later, I can't relate to that scared, frustrated 15-year-old. But I try to remember her. I want to make sure that no other young or older person is driven to do what I did. I've never done anything like it before or after. It was as if something else entered my body and took control. But what would have taken control was the pain. It's for that little girl, for Lily Ann and countless others that I'm standing here today. Validation and being believed means more than anyone will ever know. Management and care means even more than that. And without the patient round the table, that narrative is forgotten. When Lily Ann's mother called me that day, I remembered how different things could have been. I believe that the, what we see in our patient community is the result of their journey, as with most people in life. But I truly believe we can change that journey and ultimately change the outcome of so many people. And learning about the quality, transparency, accessibility, and factual accuracy every patient deserves on the UPATI course has enabled me to speak with even more conviction and determination. There is nothing more powerful than a patient advocate. A, pa a parent fighting so their child has one more day on earth, or making sure others do whilst they mourn what could have been for theirs. A husband or wife, brother or sister, loved one or friend. When that physical and emotional pain is tangible, the passion and determination that is established is a powerful thing. Couple this with a toolbox of skills, lessons, experiences shared, and an amazing breadth of knowledge, and you, Patty, have created an army of loyal soldiers, and I am proud to serve amongst them. Thank you very much. Lara, thank you very much for sharing your story. And if that doesn't give you the power of the patient, I don't know what would. We wish you well. So we are here today to celebrate 10 years of lighting the way, if you look at some of the posters there. So our final session, we're going to look at a decade of breakthrough from input to impact. Reflect and maybe look forward as well. I'm going to call Pierre Moulin to the platform, and he is going to moderate this last session for us. Pierre, I'll let you introduce your guests. Thank you very much, uh, Dean. Um, th this is actually the second time I've had to follow Lara speaking. Uh, the last time was when she graduated from the uh, uh, UPATI course. So you have a, an emotional uh, uh, thing uh, going on there, Lara. But anyway. So uh, thank you all very much for coming here today. Uh, we are indeed uh, 10 years old, if you haven't uh, realized that yet. And our last session is really talking about um, breakthroughs. And we have uh, three uh, very special guests that I'm going to introduce um, to you uh, in turn. The first one is uh, Teresa Riera Majoral. Uh, Teresa, thank you so much for uh, coming uh, here today. 
Uh, Teresa is uh, a professor of computer science and artificial intelligence at the University of the Balearic uh, uh, Islands in, in Spain. Uh, but she is here today because she has played an enormous role in uh, many activities across, uh, across the European uh, uh, area. She's been for 10 years uh, an MEP, uh, and she's uh, also uh, been a member of the Research uh, uh, Innovation and Science Policy Experts RISE, uh, chair of the expert panel uh, for the interim evaluation uh, of the uh, ICT component uh, of Horizon 2020. Uh, she was also a rapporteur uh, of the regulation establishing the IMI2, which is, I think, uh, more specifically why you're here. So, Teresa, thank you very much for your, for your time, for coming, and please uh, make your address. You could go to the podium, maybe. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Pierre, um, dear Commissioner, President of FPA, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let me thank the organizers for inviting me. It is a great pleasure for me to participate in this event to celebrate the 10 years of the IMI. I have to tell you today, especially after listening to Michelle, and talking to, to him, that very good memories uh, came to my mind from five years ago when I was rapporteur of the regulation for the IMI2 joint undertaken, and also from before, uh, when after a very short uh, time of being MEP, I was appoint appointed to be rapporteur for the specific program cooperation in FP7, which includes the launch of five GTIs, and one of them was IMI. Well, after the excellent speeches we have heard, I will not talk about the success story of IMI. I will only make a few brief comments about the present and the future of this successful partnership, especially considering that now we are at the doors of Horizon Europe, the new framework program for research and innovation. Let me start by the budget. Dear Carlos, you know perfectly, and probably some of you also know, how hard the, Europe the European Parliament fought in, in the past for a higher budget for Horizon 2020. So you can imagine how pleased we are now to see that the Commission has proposed a budget of 100 billion euros for uh, Horizon Europe. In my opinion, this helps to prove that when we say that research and innovation is a public good with a clear EU added value, we really mean it. But this is only one part. We have to recognize that Europe as a whole continue to underinvest in research and innovation compared with our global compet competitors. We have been talking about uh, the Lisbon 3% target for the last 18 years, and yet, as you all know, the EU, the EU uh, overall um, research and innovation intensity is still just above 2%, with a particularly low share in private investment. I say this because it takes to me to the key question I think we may ask ourselves today. How can IMI help to deliver the core objectives of Horizon Europe, objectives in which we have been working for a long time also in our RISE group? My answer to this question is that I really believe that IMI can contribute to achieve most of the main objectives set out in Horizon Europe. Let me only very briefly highlight five of them. Uh, first, leverage of investment. It is clear, and it was already mentioned here, that IMI 
leverage significant investments from both public and private sectors. And it does it without industry receiving any public funding and contributing to IMI with the EU's most valuable asset, which is highly skilled people. As a result, in IMI, researchers from both the public and the, pub, uh, and the private sector work together across disciplines and, bo and borders, often for the first time, and find ways to share what they previously thought that to be unshareable. That is, they work in an open collaboration uh, and both collaboration to improve collaboration and openness are also objectives of Horizon Europe. Third, impact. IMI has already proved to have a remarkable impact to address major, society, uh, major global challenges in health, such as Alzheimer, cancer, uh, antimicrobial resistance, and so on. And to increase the impact of EU research is another of the objectives of Horizon Europe. These are high uh, risk areas and extremely complex diseases that no one, no one company, university, or research organization can tackle alone. It is only through a collaborative effort, through, bring, through bringing together the best minds from industry, academia, academia passion organization, and, and SMEs in an open innovation platform that we can begin to address those challenges. So then we go to the fourth. IMI clearly contributes to maximize the innovation potential across the European Union. Despite the long, the long timeless in biomedical research, we have seen here today some very good examples of how IMI is delivering tangible results and how these results are translated into concrete benefits from European citizens. We have heard, for instance, how IMI projects are paving the way for personalized treatment for asthma, uh, diabetes, cancer, and many others. Progress in precision medicine, that was already mentioned, for which Europe is equipping itself with the appropriate tools, like, for instance, uh, HPC. Uh, that will allow even greater advances in the future, and that is placing the European Union in the forefront of global research on these fields. In my opinion, we have to congratulate ourselves for the great effort uh, the European Union, led by the Commission, is doing on this regard. And I would like to finish with a topic that is close to my heart, citizens' engagement in science. Mm, Horizon Europe opens the door to citizens' involvement in the co-development of ideas, and I have learned today that IMI is leading by example. Uh, I was really, it was really very interesting very, very interesting to listen to Val and also to Lara, uh, giving us uh, power, powerful examples on how passions can work alongside researchers and how they can contribute with their knowledge and skills to the project when they are recognized as equal partners. Dear Pierre, we have seen today how IMI can really make a difference, but I am convinced that you can do even more. Let's see how we can go on working together to bring IMI a step further in mobilizing the whole community to address the health challenges of today and then help us to lead longer and healthier life. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Teresa. And now uh, our next uh, special guest is uh, the Commissioner himself. Uh, Commissioner uh, Carlos Moedas, thank you so much for uh, being here today. Uh, you are a, a passionate and tireless advocate of innovation and uh, Carlos challenges us uh, on our own ecosystems, our own um, uh, setting the bar uh, and uh, he will uh, continue to do that. Uh, and so, uh, Commissioner Mudash, thank you so much for uh, joining us and uh, please make your address. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, um, uh, dear um, Pierre, uh, thank you so much for your, uh, for your introduction. Um, let me tell you also publicly um, how I have enjoyed uh, these couple of years since I interviewed you uh, through Skype without knowing you physically. But I think that you have brought really um, positive energy uh, you've been someone that has been able to inspire people that work for you. Um, and you have emotions, as you've shown when you listen to Lara. Uh, I think that's uh, part of the job of a great manager. And so I wanted to congratulate you publicly for your great work uh, so far. And uh, so thank you very much. Then to uh, my colleagues in the panel, Stefan uh, Horschman, that I know uh, very well from before. We have been uh, in different uh, places, the CEO of Merck, but here as the president of FPIA. Thank you so much for the leadership also of your company and for leadership. And uh, of course to Teresa uh, for helping me along the way and uh, all the great job that you've done and always unconditionally helping Europe. So that's, uh, that's fantastic. But ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and thank you uh, for inviting me for these 10 years. I really like this title of um, From Input to Impact, right? Because, you know, uh, as economists normally they talk about from input to output. But the thing is that people don't know how to measure outputs. They just know how to measure inputs. And so economists get very scared because they don't know how to measure the output really. And so they just measure the input. But you can make a difference if you measure the impact. And the impact is a different thing than the output. And I think I really like the title of the conference. But when I um, was coming here, I thought about what is it different about IMI? It's true that I've been talking a lot about IMI. And uh, when I go to conferences and uh, when I give examples of partnerships, I talk about IMI. And I think that it's because IMI is a different way of collaborating. It's really a new type of collaboration. And I think that uh, I talk a lot about radical innovation and disruptive innovation, but then I don't talk that much about what you do, which is radical collaboration. And I think the job that you've done in changing the way collaboration is done is a huge one. And the other day I was reading uh, an old book about history of science, and I was reading uh, about Spain and about Toledo in the 12th century. And in the 12th century, there was a huge movement uh, in Spain of people, scientists, going to Toledo to translate Arabic texts into Latin. And the reason was very simple, is because the Arabic texts were the ones that held the ancient Greek knowledge. And, um, and you're talking about like 10 centuries after, right? And so there was a, a, a movement of uh, these ancient Greek culture that was translated into Arabic during the Islamic golden age. But it was not in Europe. In Europe, we were focused on Latin. And I think that when you look at the history of Toledo, you see that it was the point in time where you get all these people together in Toledo and finally translating everything that was from the ancient uh, Greek culture to Latin. And people rediscovered at the time, it's now difficult to think about it, but it was like 10 or 11 centuries after, people discovered Archimedes, Aristotle, Ptolemy, and others, and they discovered things that they didn't know about it because they were not translated in Latin. 
And so I think that uh, when you go today to a bookshop and you buy uh, Plato's philosophy, you probably do it because this translation was there in the 12th century. And so if it was not for this group of translators, you might have lost all this knowledge. And uh, you imagine that at that time, people traveling thousands of miles from all over Europe, Asia, North Africa, the Middle East, and helping to translation, helping with this translation. And you're talking about Christians, with Jewish, with Muslims, scholars from different countries, communities who rarely mixed, flocked to the town and lived and arose alongside together, making sure that that knowledge would never be lost. And I think they did it because they had a kind of a long view. They were not looking into the short-term political game. They were looking into the future, a kind of a balcony view, looking at the end. And I think that that balcony view that puts aside the short-term needs, the rivalries, because you can see the long way, you can see beyond, that's what those scholars did. And I think that when you look at what you've done, and I remember when we started, somehow is also to put people together. So the job of IMI has to be the, the facilitator, to put the public sector, the private sector. And I thought about it because I think you guys live in different tribes, you know, and you talk about uh, pharma and uh, you talk about health, it's about tribes, right? And those tribes were separated and people were not talking to each other. And IMI was this amazing tool to people uh, working together. And really, I think that is the magic of that, that we have to keep as an example for the future. So if I talk about results, and I wanted to come here to tell you about what are the results of your job. And I think that the first result is exactly what I've just said. The first result is intangible. I cannot measure what you did because what you did was a change in culture, just like the scholars did in Toledo. You have to take really step back and think about the past and see how incredible that is that you were able to change that culture. And I remember going to the parliament and a lot of people in the parliament asking me questions about you because there was not visible the importance of that change in culture. That was something that people didn't understand. They said, but what are they doing? And I said, they were working together. And what are the results of that? Are the impact in the future, but you cannot measure it immediately. So for me, that change in culture has been really the major job you've done. Uh, there's a, a book from Jeff Colvin that argues that humans are underrated. And um, uh, he uh, has this uh, quote that I would like to read to you that he says, today, competitive advantage is not driven by resources you control, but by those you can access. The path to success no longer lies in clawing your way to the top as before, but in nudging your way to the center of the network. And I think that this idea of putting people together is an idea that most of the managers today don't understand because they come from a world where everything was a pyramid, was about getting to the top, was about being the best company, the best country, to have that national prestige. And today is not about going to the top, is going to the center of the network. And that's why IMI is important. And that's why it's not tangible in the short term, but will be in the long run. The second is probably the easiest, is the tangible results. What have you done? And I've been going to the parliament, to the countries, and telling about people the great job you do. And I just put it on a piece of paper. 35 new validated drug targets, more than 300 biomarkers, more than 300 new computer-based models. That's the tangible part. But people look at it and they sometimes don't see the importance. And that's why where I tell to Pierre, we have to tell those stories in a different way. 
That's where we have to engage with people in a different way. And that's why we have created this idea of having missions in our Europe and mission-driven science. And that mission-driven science has to be led by networks like yours. I was so moved to listen to Lara that I'm gonna copy a quote from you, Lara, when you said, nothing about us without us. And this movement that you see in science and innovation, that before was just about the scientists, that today is about the citizens, because the citizens are the ones that can bring that innovation, because you are the ones that know about you, that suffer, that know you what your needs are, I think it's, it's a beautiful thing. And I think that when I talk about missions, I will quote you on that, because I think the missions that I see for Europe is missions that the citizens understand, because they are the ones that drive that change. So thank you really for your, um, really your speech that was uh, so good and so really touching the really the important things that we have to change. Because in a digital world, it doesn't make sense anymore to think that uh, science is just about the scientists. You know, three years ago, I, I gave in Portugal this uh, prize called Patient Innovation Prize, the Patient Innovation Award. And you see so many doctors that came to me and said, you know, they were the ones that told us what to do. They were the ones that told us the things that we had to learn. Because we are not in their skin. We don't know. And, and really working peer to peer, as you do and I, here in AMI, is really fantastic. So I think that the tangible results are just a part of it, but they are not all of it. They are the stories that you have to tell. They are the stories that we can see outside. These innovations that are unique, these innovations that people can think, okay, this is the European money. I know where the European money is going and I want the European money to be there. And that is very important today because you know the world is changing. Our proposal of 100 billion euros is a, a very good proposal. But I don't know in seven years what Europe's going to be. You know, countries will always be there. But if you don't defend Europe, Europe is not a country. Europe is something that if the populists, if the extremists keep on pushing to the edge, then I don't know what the future will be. And that depends on those stories, and that's your responsibility. <laughs> So your big question, and I think that you just invited me for that, was about the future. So what do I think about the future? Look, I cannot be more positive about what you've done, not just because I'm here, but because I believe it, because I've seen it. But I think the next couple of months will be crucial for you. And I think that, you know, you have to prove yourself you have to have an ambitious plan that can prove that what you do cannot be done by others, cannot be done by countries alone, cannot be done just by the Commission alone, because what you do is bigger than that. You need to work in a plan that is clear, a plan that tells people what are your ambitions, to tell the people what you're working on, to tell that you're gonna be the first to find more antibiotics, to be the first to have more patients working with you, having more stakeholders, that you're not gonna be just a club of the big, that you're gonna have more SMEs, more small companies, more people, and that you can do it even bigger. And I think that if you do that, if you help on really creating the story, and you have a great story, we just have to put it at the center of the narrative and the political narrative. And if you do that with me, I think that the future is quite obvious because we need your work, we need your work in Europe, and we need your commitment. So have a clear plan in mind a clear plan that you can explain quickly to people, to the parliament, to the countries, 
to the Commission. And if you have that, and I'm sure you have, because everybody here knows, and Pierre, as I said, has been a great leader in really telling people where are we going. And I thank you so much that you have put these stories out there, because these are the stories that I need myself to tell around Europe. The stories of people like Lara, the stories of companies, the stories of the innovators. So keep collaborating, keep nudging to the center of the network, as Jeff Colvin says. Keep climbing up the balcony and don't get disturbed by the noise of the short term. Look at the long term and tell me where you go and I'll go with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner, and thank you for the very clear challenge, I think, uh, that has been uh, uh, laid down, and we will respond, of, of course. Uh, so my next uh, special guest uh, is uh, Stefan uh, Oshman. Now, I said we were 10. Merck KGA this year is 350 years old, am I right? Uh, so I'm now humbled, <laughs> uh, but uh, we're very uh, happy to have uh, Stefan Oshman, who is not only uh, the chairman uh, of the executive board and CEO of uh, Merck KGA, but also the president of the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and their associations, FPIA. Stefan, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pierre, for the kind uh, introduction. It's always a difficult act to speak after uh, Commissioner Moida, who is such a uh, passionate uh, champion of innovation in, in Europe. And um, I would still try to give it, I, I will give it a try. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to offer some FPA perspectives on IMI after 10 years, as well as a few thoughts for the future. First, I'd like to start by underlining one essential point from, from this afternoon, and it's very important to remember that IMI has delivered results that have brought real impact to patients. And it has launched many projects that will do so in the future. And let me give you a couple of examples. Commissioner has also mentioned, uh, mentioned numbers. So with the support of IMI, we have over 325 biomarkers in development. We have made major progress toward an Ebola vaccine. And thanks to IMI, there are currently five new antibiotics in development. We have achieved meaningful progress in oncology, in diabetes, and in autism. We have developed 200 predictive computer models. And thanks to IMI, eight clinical trial networks comprising close to 2,000 sites are making it easier for researchers to rapidly identify centers and patients. It's been a demanding process. There were many skeptics, including within the industry, but the results speak for themselves. And industry and academic partners have got used to working together in new ways. And this continues today. My second point is IMI's unique value lies in this collaboration and these new ways of working, which make it possible to tackle problems that could not be solved by any single partner. And I strongly believe IMI gives Europe a competitive advantage. It enables us to continue to play a leading role in scientific research and, and discovery. In my opinion, we must make sure that we continue to play this, really, this leading role in future, including our partners in the United Kingdom. We must not allow Brexit to impede scientific progress. Finally, there is trust. Half of the resources in IMI come from public sources, which means that public-private partnerships are rightfully subject to scrutiny. 
Input is gathered from many sides, and the selection process is carefully and neutrally structured. My third and last point is that we are having this conversation at the right moment. This is an exciting time in medical research. Digitalization, especially sophisticated data analysis, promises to make research and development faster, more efficient, and more effective. Technologies like genome editing allow us to take an engineering approach to biology. Therefore, we need to strengthen the PPP model to help deliver the next way of breakthroughs now. Our increasing understanding of the genetic drivers of disease is transforming the way we conduct research. It opens the way to making cancer possibly a manageable condition or to tackling the devastation of neurodegenerative diseases. But many challenges are still beyond our grasp. Alzheimer is just one, uh, one such example. On top of this, we face greater complexities with an aging population and changing lifestyles, multimorbid patients or the societal burden of, uh, of chronic disease. The mission-led approach of Horizon Europe can help us to crack some of the big challenges by concentrating minds and by bringing heavy intellectual and financial firepower. But what is also becoming clear is that, pure, that a pure top-down or insular approach to identifying research priorities will not get us where we need to go. As the, the scientific challenges associated with pharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical research increase in scope and complexity, it is paramount that we combine forces where we can. So how can we approach this? We need to co-create our research priorities with many stakeholders to ensure we are delivering what society expects and what society needs. As FPA president, I have made patient, patient engagement a top priority. We want to make sure that patients are included from the earliest stages of drug development. I've experienced in my own company that a drug that have we had, for which we had actually stopped development is now now on the market in, a, uh, in, a, um, in multiple sclerosis, and that was based on patient organization contacting us, highly competent, well-organized patients organization, contacting us and suggesting new ways of defining the therapeutic paradigm for that compound. So I, in my, in my opinion, the next generation IMI needs to go beyond industry academic collaboration to work with healthy, delivery ecosystems. And of course, of course, digitalization. It must be the core of our future research priorities. We must harness the, the vast potential that big data offers. And this should enable us to make the radical transition from prediction to prevention in healthcare and from disease management to health management. IMI has been an exemplary success story for Europe. Looking to the future European research programs, we need to scale up our ambition to match the challenge and also the opportunity. Let me end on a personal note. I started my, my uh, professional career, so I think it was 36 years ago, in academic research. I went from academic research into government and into uh, um, international or, or organization, and then, I, and, and then I went into a pharmaceutical industry r and I've met brilliant, engaged, passionate people in all of the different sectors. I also met a lot of prejudice, bias, and arrogance in all sectors. I never understood that. If we have an opportunity to collaborate, we need to push ideological barriers aside. If we think that there's something that we can do together, no matter how much we agree or disagree on ideology, we should just say, okay, let's agree to disagree, but let's focus on getting this thing done. I had the incredible privilege of already in the late 80s being involved in the first ever 
public-private partnership in pharmaceutical development. It was in a neglected, uh, for a ne against a neglected tropical disease. This partnership and so many others today have been so extremely, extremely successful. So I simply we have, as we have the power to change things, we have the moral obligation to do so. And we should leave all extremism on both sides, just, uh, just far away, uh, far away, and continue to do this, uh, continue to do this important work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan, indeed. So um, we're kind of coming to the end of the formal part, uh, but uh, I, I'm now going to become a little more directive because there are things that need to happen. <laughs> so the first thing is you can't have a birthday without a cake. So we're going to have a cake, and we're going to uh, bring our, our last uh, speakers up to, uh, to uh, cut the cake. Uh, then, as you know, we have a series uh, outside of uh, presentations of uh, projects, and these are either demonstrations or, uh, or verbal presentations of projects. You have in your program a list uh, of those, um, uh, so, uh, and, and a little map and everything, so uh, don't forget to, to do that. You will also find a set of headphones, the ones in the plastic bag, not the ones attached to your seat. <laughs> and you should take these outside when we go and, uh, and visit the, um, the, the you, it, you, it'll be obvious why, why you need them uh, afterwards. Um, of course, I want to thank everyone for, uh, for coming here uh, today. Uh, and um, I think that uh, we, uh, the, the challenge is obvious for us. Uh, in terms of what we need to put forward as a, uh, an aggressive, uh, ambitious uh, program. Uh, I think w when I came in for the, for the IMI group, uh, you'll know that my buzzwords uh, for this year were uh, technology convergence, uh, but I've, I've just changed those now to radical collaboration. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, uh, and I think we're just about to uh, receive the cake. So, um, uh, Carlos and Teresa and uh, uh, Stefan, would you please come up and um, cut the cake, or help us cut the cake? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, quick before the... And now perhaps, if we could be uh, joined by uh, Jean-Christophe and Wolfgang and Nathalie and uh, Irene, other governing board members, we can have a little photo. Carlo. Carlo, from the beginning. From the beginning. From the beginning. So, uh, please stay, uh, stay there for a minute. Irene? Sorry. I'm sorry? Magda, Magda. Are we okay, Lighty? Now, can we have a photo? I want to be in this photo.
everybody who can be free yeah. for one <laughs> minute, we have to, we get to the top. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, everyone. Uh, the only thing else uh, was that putting this together was, uh, as you can imagine, quite uh, an endeavor. And it was a true uh, trilateral collaboration uh, between uh, the Commission, FPA, and ourselves at IMI. I'd just like to thank everyone who was involved in it. and. Uh, we're now going to go towards the uh, exhibition, uh, and so please uh, enjoy, enjoy those and, and network away. Thank you very much.